uh, people always ask me for a Steve Jobs story, and so let me feel that obligation right now. Uh, one day I was working in my cubicle, and Steve Jobs shows up with this person I'd never met before, and he asked me what I thought about a company. So I proceeded to go into this diatribe. I said, well, it's kind of a mediocre company, Steve, because it has a mediocre product. This mediocre product doesn't really take advantage of graphics, mouse, video, anything modern, uh, dubious user interface, boring drilling practice, uh, mathematics software. And after this, this diatribe, he then turns to me and he says, Guy, I want you to meet the CEO of that company. So that's what it was like working for Steve. Uh, it was very, very challenging. Uh, it was the best experience of my life. I would not be where I am were it not for Steve Jobs. He was a fantastic person to work for. Not easy, uh, but fantastic. It's sort of like when you look back in your life, you know, maybe when you're in school, you think the best teacher is the easiest teacher. But 20 years later, with some perspective, you can look back and say the best teacher was the toughest teacher. And that's what I would say about Steve Jobs. I, th I think that the world is a lot less interesting without Steve now. He's been gone about six years now. And um, I can tell you one thing for sure. Right now, he is telling God what to do. <laughs> so if you don't like Universal 1.0, stick around, because Steve is redesigning it uh, to 2.0. Um, I, I have seen many, many high-tech speakers, okay? I've been in Silicon Valley for about 30 years, and I'll tell you something about high-tech speakers, other than the speakers you'll see today. They, are, they have, well, Ira Lo, they have two salient qualities. Quality number one is most tech speakers suck. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. You, know, you know I'm right, right? They suck. And second thing about tech speakers is they go long. That's a deadly combination. <laughs> you know, if you suck and you're short, who cares? <laughs> and if you're great and you're long, also who cares? But if you suck and go long, that's just a deadly combination. It's like being stupid and arrogant, right? So <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about, but you're sure you're right, right? <laughs> So what I embraced in my career is that I always use the top 10. Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, okay. <laughs> I always use the top 10 format, and I always use the top 10 format so that in case any of you are bored by my presentation, you know I have 10 key points today. You know how long I'll go. So if, you're, if you think I suck, you know approximately how much longer I'll suck. I have 10 <laughs> key points today. So these are the points that I learned about innovation as an entrepreneur as an Apple employee, as a venture capitalist, and I'm back as an entrepreneur right now. So my top 10 thoughts and recommendations about the art of innovation. Uh, the first thing that I figured out, it took me 30 years to figure this out, is that great companies, they exist because they want to make meaning. That is, they want to change the world. And the way I've come to view this is, if you make meaning, then you'll probably make money. The natural consequence of making meaning, of changing the world, of making people's lives better, is that you also make money. But if you focus simply on making money, I think you'll attract the wrong kind of people, you'll probably fail, you won't make meaning, and you won't make money. So let's look at some examples of companies and the meaning that they make. I think Apple made meaning with computers. It made people more creative and productive. Google has democratized information, so you didn't have to be rich and powerful to access all of the information in the world. Similarly, Wikipedia does this kind of thing. The company that I work for, Canva, is now trying to democratize design. So I want you to wrap your minds around this concept that great innovation, great success occurs because companies and people want to make meaning. They want to make the world a better place. If you make meaning, you will probably also make money. Step number one. Step number two is that I think you should make a mantra. A mantra is a two or three word explanation for your meaning. It describes why your meaning should exist. But first, let's look at a mission. Many companies, most companies make a mission statement. Let me read you the mission statement of Wendy's. 
The mission of Wendy's is to deliver superior quality products and services for our customers and communities through leadership, innovation, and partnerships. Now, don't get me wrong. I have four children. Any of you with children, you know that when the children outnumber the adults, when you have gone from man to man to zone, <laughs> you understand that fast food has a whole new relevancy. So I love Wendy's. I love fast food. French fries is our family's favorite vegetable. <laughs> so don't get me wrong when I put this Wendy's mission statement up, but I will tell you that in all the times that I've eaten at Wendy's, that I've driven through Wendy's, it has never occurred to me that what I am participating in is leadership, innovation, and partnerships. <laughs> I just thought I was getting French fries and a Coke, okay? So I think this is the, full, the problem with mission statements. The companies come up with this, and no employee can memorize this. Next time you go to Wendy's, ask the Wendy's employee, what's your mission statement? I don't think any Wendy's employee could do I don't think the founder of Wendy's, employee, of Wendy's could do this, repeat his mission statement. But I happen to know that's true because he's dead. So this is, my, this is my diatribe on mission statements. Too long, not memorable. If I took the word Wendy's out of this statement, would you remember what company this is for? You know how we do this, I'll tell you how we do this in Silicon Valley. So I don't know if you've ever had the mission building exercise. So the way we do it in Silicon Valley is we take the top employees to a resort. This resort has to have a world-class golf course, high correlation golf course and mission statement. So you take your employees on this two-day mission statement off-site. You're gonna decide on the mission and the strategies for the future. Uh, you, you need to have an outside meeting facilitator. Uh, the reason is that you have nobody on your management team who can lead. So if you had a leader, you wouldn't need the off-site. By definition, the fact that you need the off-site means you don't have a leader, so you have to hire an outside facilitator. In Silicon Valley, this facilitator is typically a woman. It's not to be sexist. This is just a statement of fact. Uh, this woman has a dual-track career. Not only is she a meeting facilitator and executive coach, she is also a Lamaze instructor. Because if you think about it, the concept of pushing out a baby, very similar to pushing out a mission statement. So after one day of cross-functional teams where you form groups with people you can't stand in the company, you fall into their arms. So now you all kumbaya love each other. Second day, you're in a small room. You have a pad of paper. Moonbeam, the meeting facilitator, is going to write the mission statement. There's 50 of you in the room. You figured, oh my god, I've wasted two days of my life at this stupid off-site. So I ought to get at least one word in the mission statement. That's why you have mission statements like this. So what I want to suggest to you, if you want to master the art of innovation, is come up with two or three words that describe where your innovation should exist. These are some examples. I think Wendy's mantra should be healthy, fast food. Three words to describe why that company exists. Nike, just do it as a fantastic slogan. But why does Nike exist? Authentic athletic performance. And FedEx, when you absolutely positively want something, someplace, when you want peace of mind, it's FedEx. So I ask you to take some time out and think about it. You know, can you come up with a mantra for your company? Two or three words for why your company, your service, your innovation should exist. This mantra is then used to keep your employees on the same page, to keep your customers on the same page, to keep the industry on the same page. What do you stand for? Healthy, fast food authentic athletic performance, peace of mind. The next thing is to jump to the next curve. This is probably the most important part of this presentation for what you're about to hear in, let's see, three hours, four hours, three hours and 45 minutes, where you're gonna hear about the next curve for this organization. Jumping to the next curve should set the parameters for how you innovate. Because innovation is not about doing things 10% better or 15% better. It's about doing things 10 times better. A historical example, ICE 1.0. There used to be an ice harvesting industry in the United States. This is late 1800s, early 1900s. At this time, Bubba Jr. gets a horse a saw and a sleigh in the winter 
in a cold city for a lake or a pond, goes out and cuts ice, put it on the sleigh and deliver it. Nine million pounds harvested in 1900. Ice 2.0, 30 years later. Now you freeze water centrally. You don't wait for winter. You don't have to be in a cold city. You could have an ice factory in Phoenix. You could not have ice harvesting in Phoenix. This is a major breakthrough. It doesn't have to be winter. It doesn't have to be a cold city. Ice 2.0. Ice 3.0. Now you have the refrigerator curve. Now everybody had their own ice factory. The ice man did not have to deliver ice to your house. You had your own ice factory, a PC, a personal chiller. <laughs> Very interesting story behind the story is that none of the ice harvesters became ice factories and none of the ice factories became refrigerator companies because they resisted change. How many of you use a Kodak camera in this audience? How many of you use a Smith Corona? How about a Remington Rand? How about a Polaroid? How many of you use a Telegraph? It's because these companies don't jump to the next curve. And the major reason why companies don't jump to the next curve is because they define themselves in terms of what they already do or make. If you say, I am an ice harvester, I cut ice in the winter from frozen lakes or ponds, guess what? You don't embrace the ice factory. If you define yourself as a factory that freezes water centrally and then delivers ice in a truck, guess what? You don't embrace the refrigerator business. And so what I'm asking you to wrap your minds around is to define your business in terms of the benefits that you provide to your customers. You know, is it simply a phone system or is it customer relations? Is it simply a way of getting frozen lakes into your house or is it cleanliness and convenience? If you were a typewriter company 30 years ago, do you find yourself as we make a mechanical contraption that takes an arm with a letter on it, swings, hits the paper and bounces back or are you in the communications business? The ice people, ice one, two, and three, were all in the same business, cleanliness and convenience. If they defined themselves as being in the cleanliness and convenience business, the ice harvester would jump to the ice factory curve, and the ice factories would jump to the refrigerator curve, and the refrigerator companies would jump to the biotech curve. Most companies don't do this. So I ask you now to just think about your businesses in terms of the benefits that you provide your customers as opposed to what you currently do. Get to the next curve. The fourth thing is to roll the dicey. Rolling the dicey are the five qualities that I think are essential for getting to the next curve. Quality number one is depth. Great product, great services, have lots of power. You've anticipated what people need as they come up the curve. This is an example of a deep product. This is a sandal made by Reef. It's called a fanning. Every sandal in the world has one primary purpose, to protect your feet. This sandal is deeper because that metal bar at the midsole area, it opens beer bottles. <laughs> this sandal has twice the depth of any other sandal in the world. Great products are also intelligent. When you look at them, when you hear about them, when you learn about them, you think, hmm, this company understood. This company anticipated something. Mercedes has something called pre-safe. And what pre-safe does is that it detects that the car is about to collide. When it collides, or when it collides, it will have a very loud noise that can hurt your ears. So when a Mercedes detects that it's about to collide, it puts out a very loud noise, but less loud than what is about to happen. This pre-safe noise prepares your ears for the even louder noise that's coming. This is to prevent damage to your ears. If you think about it, that's a very clever thing. I happen to love cars, so I'll give you one more car example. Uh, Ford Mustang, GT500 Shelby Mustang, 
you know, like 650 horsepower, zero to 60 in under three seconds. This is like really, just like total badass car, okay? So uh, I'm 62 years old, going through two-thirds life crisis. I would love to compensate for my feelings of inadequacy by buying a car like that. Uh, but I have four children. Two of those children are male drivers, and the concept of either of those kids driving a 650 horsepower car is immoral. And so, but I learned something. I learned something that Ford has a very intelligent product. Just like Mercedes has pre-safe, Ford has a product called the My Key. And what the My Key enables you to do is program the top speed of the car into the key. So that's right, Dad is at NextCon in Phoenix. He left his Mustang, but he left the key programmed to go no faster than 55 miles an hour. <laughs> I think that is an intelligent product. Next quality of great stuff is completeness. It's not only deep, it's broad. Think of the broadness of Google, right? Search, analytics, social media, Google Photos, Google Docs, Google Car, Google everything. Think of the completeness of Google. Great products and services are also empowering. They make you better. They make meaning. This is a MacBook Air. MacBook Air, Macintoshes make people more creative and productive. That's what a Macintosh does. The other operating system, you have to fight, right? It's you or Windows. <laughs> if you want your Windows laptop to print, you have to wrestle it to the ground. It's not sitting there waiting to help you become more creative and productive. This is a MacBook Air, as I said. This is, you know, this cool, thin block of aluminum awesomeness. It looks like a Tibetan monk machined it from a solid block of aluminum. <laughs> Right? Or you can buy the big, thick, black, ugly plastic laptop with the Windows operating system on it. The choice is yours. <laughs> great products, great services empower people. You know, you could take the evangelist out of Apple. You can't take the Apple out of the evangelist. And the last thing is that great products, great services are elegant. Somebody cared about the user interface, the design. And as I said, later today, you're going to learn about the next curve that you'll experience from this company. Very exciting times. Number five. Number five is stolen from a song by Bobby McFerrin. He said, don't worry, be happy. What I learned about innovation is don't worry, be crappy. Which is to say that when you have jump curves, when you have created something that's dicey, it's OK to ship it with elements of crappiness to it. I'm not saying ship crap. I'm saying ship a revolution, and it can have elements of crappiness to it. First Macintosh. This is what was crappy about the first Macintosh. It had 128K of RAM. We thought that was an ocean of RAM. Had a 400K floppy drive. My god, what were people going to do with all that storage? We were working on a 5 megabyte secret hard disk. 5 megabytes. 5 megabytes. My god, what were people going to do with all that storage? 5 megabytes. $2,500. You know, first Macintosh was a piece of crap, but it was a revolutionary piece of crap. And if we had waited for chips to be cheap enough and fast enough, for color display, for all the good stuff that had happened, we would have never shipped. The world would have passed us by. First laser printer, $7,000. Prints one-sided, 8.5 by 11 only. Slow network, limited fonts, piece of crap. But it was already so much better than the existing letter quality and daisy wheel printers. It was OK to ship. If you're in the biotech business, please ignore this recommendation. That's it. <laughs> but, what, but what I'm trying to tell you is once you jump to the next curve, it's OK to ship. Eric Reese has a concept of the minimum viable product, MVP. If I were cleverer, I would have use that acronym, but I came up with don't worry, be crappy. That's why you know who Eric Reese is and not who I am. That's why there's a drawing to stand in line for Steve Wozniak and not me. It's OK, I'm not offended, next Steve. So <laughs> I'm asking you, I'm asking you, again, don't ship crap. But when you have that next curve, you know, the first refrigerator was probably much more convenient than the best ice factory. Get to the next curve, don't worry. Be crappy. Number six, I stole this from Chairman Mao, although I failed to see how he ever implemented this. This is to let a thousand, excuse me, let a hundred flowers blossom. Now, 
What I'm trying to say here is that when you have an innovation, you may encounter a very interesting situation where you ship it, and then people who you did not intend as your customer use your product or service, and they use it in unintended ways. And lots of people freak out when this happens. My God, the wrong people are buying our product or service, and they're using it in ways we did not plan. Lots of companies get freaked out when that happens. We need another off-site. <laughs> because we need to get our team together and figure out why are the wrong people buying our stuff in large quantities? Let me give you a piece of advice. Should this ever happen to you? Step number one, take the money. <laughs> Don't be proud. Always take the money. In Apple's case, you know, we thought we had a spreadsheet database and word processing machine. Oops, come to find out, we were rejected in all three markets. What flower blossom that saved Apple was desktop publishing. Desktop publishing, Aldous PageMaker. No Aldous PageMaker, no desktop publishing. There would be no Apple today. Aldous PageMaker was a gift from God to Apple. I believe in God. And one of the reasons why I believe in God is there is no other explanation for Apple's continued survival than the existence of God. Okay? <laughs> Let a hundred flowers blossom. You think you have a spreadsheet database or a processing machine? Come to find out the market says it's a desktop publishing machine. Hallelujah. Take the money. Tell people, yes, that's what we intended for this machine, desktop <laughs> publishing. Let me tell you how Silicon Valley works. In Silicon Valley, we all throw random stuff against the wall, okay? One percent of it sticks to the wall. We go up to the wall with a paintbrush. We paint the bullseye around it, and then we say, people, we hit the bullseye. <laughs> we hit the bullseye. Aren't I smart? I don't want to burst any bubbles for you, but that's how it works. If you think in Silicon Valley we know what the hell we're doing, I hate to burst your bubble, okay? Let a hundred flowers blossom. If you, were, if you were Avon, CMO of Avon, and you have this new product line called Skin So Soft, well, duh, what's Skin So Soft supposed to do? Make your skin soft. It's about beauty and hope and all that kind of stuff, right? Then you find out, oh my God, moms are buying Skin So Soft as an insect repellent. Oops. You know, our ideal marketing position was not better for your children than DDT. That wasn't the plan. And yet, if you're Avon, you say, let a hundred flowers blossom. You want to use it as an insect rebellion? Hallelujah. Take the money. Skin so soft, the kindest, gentlest insect repellent for your precious jewels. <laughs> Come on down. 16 ounce, 32 ounce, 64 ounce spray, aerosol, whatever you want. Let a hundred flowers blossom. Take the money. Number seven. Number seven is that you are willing to polarize people. This is a picture of a TiVo. TiVo allows you to time shift programs. I happen to love to watch TV, but I travel a lot, and so I always have to time shift my programs. And you know, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I don't want you to think, oh, yeah, guy, you know, you're like watching all these PBS specials about Elizabethan England and you know, life of Charles, uh, not, I was gonna say Charles Barkley. You wouldn't be watching. <laughs> Probably not Charles Barkley. William Shakespeare. Pick somebody I don't watch. So, no, I, 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 my tastes are not that high. I'm, my, my kind of taste in the stuff I time shift is more along the lines of a retired Navy SEAL living a happy life with his wife and daughter. Wife and daughter get killed by terrorists. He goes into a deep funk, you know, al abusing alcohol and drugs. He's just totally depressed. He's angry because the only things that matter to him in his life have been taken by terrorists. Uh, one day he's in a drunken stupor and he hears this whoop, 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 whoop. Looks outside in his yard and there's this black helicopter that's just landed. These people come out with, you know, things in their ears and they say, okay, come and get in the helicopter. He's like, what are you talking about? He gets in the helicopter. The helicopter takes him to the uh, White House, gets into the White House, goes into the White House. The president says, CIA is ineffective, NSA is ineffective, FBI is ineffective, military is ineffective. I don't care about Constitution, I don't care about Miranda, I don't care about due process. Here's a presidential pardon in advance. I just want you to kill terrorists. Gets back in the helicopter, goes home, he goes into his house, he presses his button, back of the 
closet opens up, there's like M16s, grenade launchers, stingers, you know, samurai swords. He like mans up, gets all this, goes out and kills terrorists, then he falls in love with this woman, but he doesn't know if she's a Mossad spy or not. Anyway, that's the kind of programs I watch. So, that's probably too much information. Anyway, Polaroid, uh, excuse me, Polaroid. TiVo polarizes people. People like me love TiVo. But people hate TiVo. Brands hate TiVo because I only watch commercials one day a year, right? Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> Every other day of the year, I don't watch any commercials. These brands are paying millions of dollars to make and place commercials, and people like me are not watching them. Brands and agencies hate TiVo. If you're a 49ers fan, that's the only day you really can stand watching the Super Bowl is because you can watch the commercials because you know your team is not in there. So, <laughs> so what I'm telling you is that great products and great services polarize people. I'm not saying you should intentionally piss people off. I'm saying that if you create a great product, a great service, you will piss people, some people off. And it's okay. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's the goal, but one of the signs of great innovation is that it upsets people. Macintosh upsets people. Android upsets people. Great products. You know, imagine if you're a taxi cab company and you hear about Uber. Well, you're not probably, you know, doing backflips of happiness over that. If you're a hotel company and you hear about Airbnb, you're probably not doing backflips about that. It polarizes people. It's okay. Number eight. Number eight, I stole from Black Panthers. They said, burn, baby, burn. But innovators in business, they churn, baby, churn, which means that you have to take version one and make it one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, one, five, two point oh, right? For two people who have been in business for 37 years, you understand this. If you look at what you did 37 years ago till today, you've churned dozens of times. I'd say that this is one of the hardest lessons for an entrepreneur, for an innovator. Because to be an innovator and an entrepreneur, you need to be in denial, right? You need, you all know, you need to ignore people. Because people are going to tell you it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, it isn't necessary. You know, stick with your job, learn COBOL, stay a programmer, work for a bank, that's a safe job, right? So you need to be able to ignore these people. But then once you ship your revolution, once you open up your first refrigerator factory, then you're going to have to ignore people who said no one would buy a refrigerator and listen to people as they tell you how to fix the refrigerator. With Macintosh, nobody told us to build a Macintosh. They told us to build a better, faster, cheaper Apple II. Because if you ask your current customers what do they want, they'll probably say better, faster, cheaper, status quo. But if you want to get to the next curve, you have to ignore them. But then once you ship, then you have to start listening to them again. It is the hardest bit to flip. Uh, it took the Macintosh division about two to three years to go from ignoring the naysayers to listening to people about how to evolve the Macintosh revolution. <laughs> Number nine. Number nine is all the marketing you need to know. Okay? Simple graph. Vertical axis is uniqueness. Horizontal axis is value. How many of you have ever dealt with McKinsey? You can hold your hand up high. You don't have to be ashamed of this. So, <laughs> So I'll tell you, for those of you who have not worked with McKinsey, when you work with McKinsey, basically everything comes down to a two-by-two two matrix. And McKinsey typically charges you about $5 million to tell you you need to be in the upper right-hand corner. <laughs> so because of Nextiva, your kind host, we're going to tell you that for free. You want to be in the upper right-hand corner, okay? <laughs> Write that down. So we're going to go through the four corners. In the bottom right corner is the corner where you have something that's useful, it's valuable, but it's not unique. In that corner, you always have to fight on price. If you slap the same operating system on the same hardware, guess what? You have to fight with Lenovo and Dell in that corner. It's always about price. In the opposite corner, you have built something that only you do. You own that market, but it is not valuable. In that corner, you are just plain stupid. <laughs> you own a market that does not exist. The bottom left corner is even worse. The bottom left corner is the dot-com corner. In that corner, you are not unique and you are not valuable. The best example of this is Pets.com. 15 years ago, a company called Pets.com. Pets.com, let me explain. You're all you know, into CRM and stuff. 
business communication. Let me give you the pitch for pets.com. 300 million Americans, one in four owns a dog, 75 million dogs. Each dog eats two cans of dog food per day. Total addressable market of 150 million cans of dog food per day. And unlike B2B, this is B2C, or more accurately, B2D. Dogs eat every day. So you take 365 and you multiply by 150 million. That's the total addressable market for pet food online. This is simple supply chain management. You have a cow, you have a dog. You need to kill the cow, cut it into pieces, put it in a can, get it to the dog. That's it. That's it. Simple, simple business. So the innovators in Silicon Valley said, wow, we can disintermediate, make this chain more efficiently. So now you kill the cow, put it in a can, ship it directly to the dog. You skip the pet food store. So we can discount pet food 25%. That was the pitch. How hard could this be? 150 million cans of dog food per day, 365 days a year. Well, the problem and the reason why Pets.com was not that valuable is because, yes, you could discount at the top line, but then guess what? The can with the dead cow in it is still in the warehouse. You've got to get it to the dog. So to get it to the dog, you need to add shipping and handling. And then somebody needs to be at home when the dead cow in the can arrives. <laughs> so it was not so convenient, and it was just as expensive, not valuable. And then because of stupid people like me, we said, hmm, 150 million cans of dog food per day, 365 days. That's a humongous market. So there's pets.com, mypets.com, epets.com, lastminutepets.com. It was not unique, and it was not valuable. So the corner you want to be in as an innovator, as an entrepreneur, as a small business person, is the upper right-hand corner. Some examples from my life. I love to watch movies. For the theater that I go to, the only way I can buy a movie ticket at home and know that I have a ticket, not have to stand in line, is Fandango. This is a unique and valuable service for me because when you take your kids to the movie, you really want to know that you have a ticket because it is such a logistical nightmare to get your kids into the minivan to take them to the movies. This is a Breitling emergency watch. If you unscrew the big knob at the 5 o'clock position, you pull it out, an antenna pops out, that antenna starts broadcasting emergency signals that airplanes catch. So if you're about to die, if you've skied off the course and you're about to freeze to death, if you are a sailor and your mast is broken and you're you know, in the middle of the Pacific and you're about to die, you pull this out and next thing you know, Kevin Costner is in the Coast Guard helicopter <laughs> coming down in the wire basket to save you, okay? This is a unique and valuable watch. I don't know many watches that can save your life. And this is a car that came a few years ago to the United States. This is a Mercedes smart car. We all have cars that can park parallel to the curb. But what if there's hardly any parking? How many of us have cars that can park perpendicular to the curb? So my theory is that all of marketing boils down to this. How are you unique and valuable? When you invent the first iPod, it's unique, a user interface that mere mortals could operate. It's unique, you can buy songs easy, cheaply from the largest publisher unique and valuable. So if you're the engineer in your business, create a product or service that's unique and valuable. If you're the marketeer in your business, convince the world that you are unique and valuable. That's all the marketing you need to know. Number 10. Number 10 is to perfect your pitch. As an innovator, as a revolutionary, you need to be able to perfect your pitch. Life is a pitch. Some tips for you. Number one is customize your intro. Always try to Start with some story that riffs off the previous speaker or somehow shows that you're connected to the audience. Uh, I, I often use pictures. This is a picture of an LG washer and dryer. So the scenario here was that I was in Brazil to speak to the Latin American management of LG. However, I was already in Sao Paulo when I figured out, you know, guy, if you had really thought about this, you would have taken a picture of your LG washer and dryer that you own so you could open up your speech to LG with a picture of your washer and dryer. But I wasn't that smart. But you know the two kids that I won't let them drive a Mustang? They're at home, right? So I figure, huh, 
I, I'll invoke a little reciprocation. I'll give them an opportunity to pay back their father. <laughs> so I send both boys a text message. Say, you know, basically the gist of it was, pause Call of Duty that I bought you on the Xbox that I bought you. Go downstairs in the house that I bought you with your iPhones that I bought you. And take a picture of the LG washer and dryer that I bought you to keep your clothes clean. And I need this right away because I'm about to speak in Brazil. OK? So how many of you have teenage boys in this house? It's, so guess what? After half an hour, what happened? Nothing, right. So to set up the next slide, older boy is Nick, younger boy is Noah, OK? Nick Noah. I send a message to my older boy, figuring he's more responsible. Say, Nick, you know, did you get my text message about needing a picture? Nick says, well, Noah said he got it too, and he's going to take the pictures. And since you're talking to LG, can you get us some free TVs? <laughs> yeah, welcome to my life. Welcome to my life. Anyway, Noah did send the pictures. Those are the pictures that you see. He did send them. Now he has more than 25% of my estate in my will. <laughs> Pictures are a very good way. So uh, when I spoke in Moscow, I opened up with this picture, and I said, wow, you Russians. I had no idea. You really have big balls in Russia. <laughs> this is before Ukraine. This is the best picture of all, though. This picture is me in the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul, which is a fantastic place. I hope you put this on your bucket list. You must visit Istanbul once in your life. And I tell you, I was speaking to Turkcell, the kind of AT&T of Turkey. I don't mean that as an insult, but Turkcell. And, and the guy behind me is the shopkeeper. So I opened up with this picture to Turkcell. And let me tell you, there's a whole story behind this picture. You see the guy behind me, that's the shopkeeper. You see how happy that guy is? That guy is happy. You, you know what that guy is thinking? That guy is thinking, this dumbass American is going to buy this fez. <laughs> This stinking fez has been in my family's shop for three generations. And finally, I found some dumbass who's going to buy this fez. I make, happy, I make people happy wherever I go. But anyway, when you open up the Turk cell showing yourself wearing a fez in the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul, it sets you up for success with your audience. Now, you may not do stuff like this, but I'm telling you, the greatest gift ever given to a great pitch is LinkedIn. Before you make a pitch, you check everybody's background in LinkedIn. You want to find points of commonality. You want to find out that you both went to the same school, that you both love golf, that you both have adopted children. Whatever it is, you're trying to find some point of commonality. That's the key. Second thing is to follow what I call the 10-20-30 rule. The 10-20-30 rule of pitching is that the optimal number of slides in a presentation is 10. 10. 10 is about all an audience can handle, 10 key points, 10 slides. Now, you're not stupid. You're sitting there saying, guy, you're such a hypocrite, typical Silicon Valley, California guy. You're telling us to use 10, and you're at like number 50 right now, right? You're so full of it. You're a hypocrite. Let me explain. I'm on number like 50 now. I'm telling you to use 10. You know why? You are not me. Yeah? <laughs> You should also be able to give your presentation in 20 minutes because you never really have an hour. You never do. Things start late. People need to leave early. And besides, to my utter consternation, to this day, roughly 90% of the world uses Windows laptops. And I know, I know, after being in hundreds of meetings, when somebody shows up with a Windows laptop, you need to allocate at least 40 minutes for them to make it work with the projector. Okay? <laughs> And then you need to make the smallest font 30 points. If you just did this, if you made your font 30 points and kept cutting until only the text at 30 point fits, you would make your presentation so much stronger. A very good rule of thumb is figure out who the oldest person is in the audience, divide his or her age by two. 60 year old people, 30 points. 50 year old people, 25 points. Someday you may, pay, may be pitching to a 16 year old that day, use the eight-point font, okay? <laughs> and until that day, 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30-point font. Number 11 is a bonus for my friends. Don't let the bozos grind you down. 
There are two kinds of bozos in the world. Bozo number one, slovingly disgusting, pocket protector, Japanese watch, rusty car, a loser. You look at that person and you say, wow, you're a loser. That's not the dangerous bozo because only a loser listens to a loser. Duh. So if you're not a loser, you don't have to be worried about that dangerous bozo because you're going to ignore a loser. No problem. The dangerous bozo for you is the winner bozo. What's the qualities of a winner bozo? Winner bozo is dressed in all black. Winner Bozo owns lots of things that end in I, like Lamborghini, Maserati, Ferrari, Armani, Audi's okay. And, and you look at that person, and you say, my God, you know, rich and famous equals smart. Rich and famous does not equal smart. Rich and famous usually equals lucky, not smart. So you have to be very, very cautious about looking at rich, famous, successful people and thinking that they're right. I mean, by this test, we would all listen to Tom Cruise about spirituality. We'd listen to Kim Kardashian about families, okay? So <laughs> you need to be skeptical. You need to be skeptical. I think that bozosity is like the flu. How do we fight the flu? We all get a flu shot. We get vaccination. A flu shot is a little bit of flu so that when your body encounters big flu, it's already prepared. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to give you some bozosity. So when you encounter bozosity in your careers, you already say, huh, remember that time that I went to NextCon and guy gave me this bunch of like little inoculations, little shots of bozosity? Now it's kicking in. The antigens are already built up. So this telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Western Union wrote off telephony in 1876. Oops. You know, Western Union should be PayPal, should be Bitcoin. It should be square. But man, if you write off telephony, it's hard to get to internet. The gap is too big. There's no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. Ken Olson, founder of DEC. Oops, right? Can you imagine if you're Steve or Waz? Ask Waz. Ask Waz when you see him, right? Ask Waz. So Waz, you know, like back when you were starting Apple, probably everybody's telling you, you need some real good advice, advisors. Go to someone who's been there and done that, someone who's recognized. Go to someone like Ken Olson and ask Ken Olson for, your, for his advice about how you should build Apple. My thing is that I think if Waz and Jobs had met Ken Olson in an elevator in Las Vegas at Comdex, said, Mr. Olson, you know, we have a different vision for computing. We think computers should be small and cheap and easy to use. So small, so cheap and easy to use, Mr. Olson, that you could have a computer in your house, Mr. Olson. Because at that point, Mr. Olson would have said, son, there is no reason why anyone would want a computer in their house. If they want to do something like balance their checkbook, they will simply get back in their car, drive to the office, and use Quicken running on a deck mini computer. So son, before you ruin your life, learn COBOL, come work for DEC. Ken Olson was a great entrepreneur, a great innovator. But you know what? If you own the most ice factories, guess what you probably would not embrace? Refrigerators. You need to get to the next curve. This is my own bozosity. My own bozosity. It's too far to drive, and I don't see how it can be a business. I said this when I was asked if I wanted to interview for the position of the first CEO of Yahoo. I told the venture campus, too far from my house. It was one hour away. I don't want to drive that far, two hours a day. You know, my, we already had one son. Second son was in beta. <laughs> and I said, you know, I just I can't see it's how it's going to be a business. It's too far to drive. So I, I passed up the opportunity to interview for the CEO position of Yahoo. Now, Yahoo's in difficult times now, but this is way back when, right? I figured this answer cost me $2 billion. I wouldn't be here if I had said, yeah, I'll take the job. <laughs> Just FYI. So, so everybody can be a bozosity. Everybody can be a bozo. Don't be a bozo. I wish I could tell you that whenever somebody tells you you can't succeed, it means you will succeed. It's not that easy. But, but if somebody tells you you can't succeed and you listen to them and never try, you will never know. And that's the worst outcome of all. Two more slides for you. This is a screenshot from my company's homepage. It's called Canva, C-A-N-V-A. And if you ever need to make graphics, you use Canva? How many use Canva already? Really? It's my kind of crowd, yeah. So think of Canva as a fast, free, easy way to 
make great graphics. All kinds of graphics that we figured it all out for you, all templated, all designed in advance. I promise you that in the time it takes you to boot Photoshop, you can make a graphic in Canva. And this is a little gift for you if you ever want to try Canva. There are places where you may have to pay a dollar for a photo. If you use your own photos, you never will. But if you ever want to use it, go to canva.com slash gift, gift slash guy live, and please try Canva. That's the end of my commercial. I just want to reiterate to you the art of innovation. It is about making meaning, making the world a better place. Make a two or three word mantra to explain how you're getting the world to a better place. Don't worry, be crappy. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be the next curve. Ice 1.0, ice 2.0, ice 3.0. Remember the marketing matrix, two by two matrix. You're in the upper right hand corner, unique and valuable. But above all, don't let the naysayers, don't let the clueless people, don't let the bozos grind you down and tell you you cannot succeed. The most important lesson of all of the art of innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.